Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to this session that's being brought to you by two teams at the PRI, uh, the guidance team that I represent and uh, the investor education team. Um, my name is Mikhail Bartek. I'm responsible for listed equity work streams at the PRI. I'm a former research analyst and um, fund manager. Um, at the PRI, we are sort of committed to delivering um, products and guidance to investors to help them, to our signatories, to help them uh, to move from commitments to actions. And uh, you know, we believe that bringing together um, investor guidance and uh, insightful education products is one way to achieve that objective. Um, I'm joined today, I'll, I'll shortly introduce the panelists, but I'm also joined today by my colleague, uh, Anthony Roberts, who's the director of uh, investor education. And towards the end of this session, he will you know, say more about, um, about uh, you know, what his team are doing. And he will also um, provide you with an opportunity to do something more with the learnings from this session by basically, um, you know, by basically providing you with uh, a specially designed complementary online learning module. But we'll deal with that towards the end of today, after we've done with any you know, questions from the audience. But first, uh, let me introduce uh, the panelists. We have uh, Mary Jane McQuillan from Clearbridge Investments and uh, Vesa Suryolainen from Varma in Finland. I will let them briefly introduce themselves. Mary Jane. Great. First, I'd like to say thank you to Mikal and to the PRI for inviting me to participate in this PRI in person. And uh, just a few words about my firm. Uh, Clearbridge Investments, in case you don't know, is a listed equities active manager. We have over 60 years of active equity experience and over 35 years of ESG investing experience. Our headquarters is in New York City, but we have offices around the world. And I have uh, my colleagues here in the front from Franklin Temple to Japan, and from Singapore, and from Brandywine, and Clearbridge, of course. Um, so in terms of ESG integration, um, just to give you a sense of my role, uh, I have two hats or two roles. First is I'm head of ESG, which means I have responsibility to oversee firm-wide ESG integration with my partner, the director of research. And secondly, I am a portfolio manager for our sustainability leaders equity strategy. And so with the two, uh, I have had both roles at the firm for about 20 years in, in terms of head of ESG and a portfolio manager. Um, in terms of ESG integration, we believe that all fundamental analysts, and we have 37 fundamental analysts, should be the ESG analysts. And they should conduct all the ESG engagements as well as the fundamental engagements. And so our analysts are responsible uh, for assigning a proprietary ESG rating for every company that they cover. And again, this is 100% ESG integration across the firm. And when they present their ESG rating, it's along with their valuation and risk reward. So um, the other part that's a little bit different is that the analysts have been assigned or, or uh, paid on their ESG performance as part of their incentive compensation since 2012. So I'll stop there and pass it over to Vesa. Thank you, Mary Jane. Um, my name is Vesa Suryalan, and, and I, I work as a responsible uh, in the responsibilities with Dima as a development manager at Parma Mutual Pension Insurance Company. We are a uh, pension insurance company and asset owner in Finland, Helsinki, with up just under 60 billion euros under management. Uh, my role is to develop responsible investment in all of the asset classes that we have, meaning we have listed equities, fixed income, hedge funds, uh, infrastructure, private equity, private debt, so and real estate. Um, and um, our main goal uh, is our main target regarding sustainability is to achieve a carbon neutral portfolio by 2035 already. And that means that we will be uh, reducing our carbon emissions, the total portfolio emissions by 25% in 25 and minus 50% in, in uh, 2030. And for listed equities uh, spe specifically, we are targeting also carbon intensity reductions, where we are reducing the carbon intensity of our listed equity portfolio by 50% uh, versus the year 2020 by 2027. And we also use a roadmap for utility investments, where we are making sure that our 
utility investments in the utility sector is in line with the NGFS scenario for 1.5 degrees. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Vesa. So what do we mean by ESG integration? Well, we have an official definition, which is including ESG factors and in investment analysis and decisions to better manage risks and improve returns. It's one of many definitions out there, but this is what, what, we, what, what we use. Um, and um, what does it actually mean in practice? It really depends on individual circumstances and you know, range of possible factors. What we have done earlier this year is that we've published an extensive ESG integration technical guide with listed equities in mind, and there we uh, put the investment process into a broader kind of five-part framework, um, and the investment process itself, um, or the, the possibilities or the, the range of approaches, um, are broadly split into three core groups, of which we're going to focus on one today, the first one, which is obviously the active fundamental approach. The other approach is active quant or systematic uh, approach. And the passive approaches are explained in that technical guide as well, but it's not the topic of today's conversations. Uh, by the way, link to that technical guide is provided um, uh, through the conference app. If you go on the agenda into this session, there are some documents attached or provided to support the session. And so the technical guide is, is one of those. So thinking about the active fundamental process, we see that uh, as consisting of four core steps. One, the first one is obviously uh, actual uh, fundamental analysis of the issuer, um, which enables the analyst to establish a view on, um, on the business and uh, enables the analyst to, uh, to have a view on future outlook, um, making it possible to you make forecasts, choose a valuation model, and make an investment decision. Um, the third part in the bottom right, I appreciate the, 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 the font size is very small, so I don't <laughs> expect you to see exactly what's on the screen. But the bottom right uh, part is the portfolio construction side, which again, we're not covering today. Our focus is going to be on the top left, the fundamental analysis, and top right, uh, forecasting and valuation. Um, I do need to mention that the fourth component of this framework is stewardship, which we see increasingly integrated actually with, with all the other steps in the process. So what do we mean by fundamental analysis? Well, again, depends on specific circumstances, but ultimately the investor will use one of his or her favorite or maybe uh, organization-wide sort of frameworks to carry it out. Um, and to, one of the purposes of today's uh, sort of discussion is to um, you know, touch on some of these elements, such as the information sources, um, some of which are mentioned uh, on that slide. Um, and another important component of this process is the ident identification of material ESG factors. Um, we um, have seen signatories obviously make more and more progress in relation to all of these, which would enable them to um, then uh, basically combine ESG analysis with the more traditional fundamental analysis, enabling them to then go into the choice of uh, forecasting models or valuation approaches. Um, so moving on to the, you know, the second component, forecasting and valuation, ultimately um, analysts who have gone through the in-depth scrutiny of companies and those who have gone through the materiality assessment should be in a good position to come up with forecasts uh, to whatever degree of detail um, they you know, feel uh, appropriate. Um, and it may be that some of the issues or factors are difficult to quantify specifically. So, it, so maybe some of these, uh, some of the forecast items um, on the PLNL cash flow or balance sheet will need some fine tuning depending on um, the materiality of, of ESG factors that may perhaps be difficult to, uh, to quantify. So, um, so the, the, the process and some examples of how our signatories deal with these are again covered in that technical guide, but the purpose of today's session is to illustrate some of these elements on uh, companies that, uh, that uh, um, Clearbridge are basically um, analyzing and scrutinizing in depth. 
I'll now hand over to Mary Jane and she will uh, talk you through um, that process. Thank you. I was going to sit down, but I feel like now I'm going to stand <laughs> up too. Um, so I just going to quickly just kind of like as a backdrop before we go into our company examples. At Clearbridge, are, as I said, our fundamental analysts are the ESG analysts. And so part of their responsibility is within each sector, the sector analysts, and this is just a snapshot for you to see, um, will assign the weights of the E, the S, and the G across each sector. And the point of this slide is to show you that there are multiple industries within each sector. And I'll just go back here just to give you the full. And you'll see that the weights of ES and G are not the same within the industries within the same sector. And so the point of this slide is to say it's not a one size fits all. It's very much how you would value companies differently fundamentally. You also could value or assign ESG weights uh, for your analysis uh, similarly. Okay. So uh, Vesa and I had talked this through, uh, and we initially were thinking of doing one company case study, but we realized to truly try to give you a sense, uh, we're going to do two companies. And it's, it's fairly ambitious because McCall has a very aggressive schedule for us in our short period of time. So I apologize in advance that this is going to be very brief and high level, but we're happy to go into more detail during the Q&A or during the table sessions. And so the two companies we selected were a utility company and a food, packaged food company. And we thought those were the ESG factors and weights were different enough to give you a sense of how we look at one with utility is more around, they say climate and the food company touches the sustainable agriculture and biodiversity. So those are two very topic, timely topics, climate and biodiversity today. So our utilities analyst in New York, Tatiana, um, looks at utilities across as a sector. And she put down a few just examples. This is not the exhaustive list of what she sees as being really material issues uh, within E, S, and G. And for those who can't see, or if you can see, I'll just name a few. For E, she talks about harmful, um, harmful air emissions like SOx and NOx and carbon dioxide. For the S for social, she talks about the regulatory framework, which is really key for every utility, the regulatory framework. And then for G, governance, she talks about, say, operating excellence, which is uh, an important part of how the company operates itself, its own operations. So we're going to now go down. We went from the sector and we're going down to a, uh, a single company to kind of broaden that out. And here we have a company. Uh, it's um, all the companies we are told to be anonymous, and it's somewhat fictional, but not entirely. And it's uh, you know meant to protect the innocent, but it's meant to be illustrative. So this is more to give you a sense rather than being exact numbers on everything. If you see here that the energy source transition go back to 2005 through to 2021 you'll see that the dirtier assets like coal and oil transition away for this company, Utility Co., into cleaner, lower emission um, uh, fuel sources and assets. So clean solar and wind, and then more natural gas. And then if we forecast out to 2031, and this is from the, the company we're talking about, you'll see another transition where it's very much into the lower emissions and green and the independent power, purchase power. So I'm going to quickly go through these just to give you a sense of some of the um, factors or considerations she would look at. So the carbon emissions profile. Here, our company is the line that's below, and the industry is above. And you can see for over these 20 years, Utility Co. had 28% lower emissions than the industry. Okay. Another, we talked about operational excellence. So for over 30 years, our company, which is the company in the bottom, relative to the industry average, was able to keep their costs through operating and maintenance costs for non-fuel, which is like their assets and their own operations, down by 66% lower than the industry. So that's like that's a cost savings big time. And then service reliability, as you can imagine, a utility must or cannot have interrupted power. So they need to make sure that they're always providing power 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And on average, in terms of reliability for the communities that they serve, uh, they have a 62% better reliability than the national average for other utilities. 
So now we're going into how do we think about um, how do we think about industry specific ESG factors into the financial uh, analyst valuation. So these bullets are very small, so I'm going to kind of read them just so you can follow along. And again, these numbers are for illustrative purposes. And so first, we should note that the company, the analyst believes that this company should receive a premium valuation, which she attributes to the company's cleaner generation profile, um, efficient operations, and constructive regulatory framework. Again, good relations with the regulators. And this company has a consistent ability to deliver the highest earnings growth in the sector. And here you can see it says um, investors assigned a 35% average premium over the last 10 year period. Again, consistency. And we also see that if she thinks about her um, framework, this company's actions, these ESG considerations support her view that this company deserves a higher valuation. If we look at her um, low high, she has 5% and 11%. 5% on the low end, 11% on the premium for um, a higher quality regulated utility with faster growth outlook. So even on the low end at five, she's not in the negative, she still has it as a, a, sing, a mid single digit number. And then on the risk reward, she has targets that on the low end is uh, 64 on, in terms of target price and the high end 89. So this implies 6% um, base and then and an increase of 31% on the upside from current levels. Last slide for this company, our infrastructure analyst team in Australia tried to take, and works with our utilities analysts in New York, said let's take a kind of a broader look at the industry and say what do we do in different types of scenario analysis. And in this case, on the left side in the y-axis, you'll see the excess return, which is the IRR less the cost of equity. And along the bottom, you'll see different energy mix scenarios. So we don't have time to go through every one, but the red one is our utility company as the example. And what you'll see is different scenarios. So if we look at the one to the right of the company, full EV 2040, they're saying, what happens to our company down the road or in the future if everyone switches over to electric vehicles? The need for the renewable power, the electrification, jumps up um, from, from today. But then if we go over to the right a little bit further, what happens if the EU sets the net zero target for 2050 and they meet it? Or to, to get to that point, they're going to have a lot of renewable power, and a lot of clean power. So again, just to briefly show, this is giving a scenario analysis of how our company could benefit from these changes in the industry. And then you can see market share scenario. What happens if they lose market share, if they maintain or they gain? And then what happens in terms of the project returns um, or keeping maintenance? So I think I'm going to pause there. And Vess is going to talk about the same situation. Sure. Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, like overall, I think even though we are a Finnish asset owner, uh, Mary Jane represent a American asset manager. We we are thinking pretty much in line about the issues regarding the companies. And I think like this, this picture is, is at the core for a utility company because it gives you a rough idea on, on the company's idea and, and what are the priorities for, for a utility company like, like this. And um, uh, the environmental factors are, of course, the most important in the case for a utility. Um, and what's interesting here that you see the relatively big share for natural gas. Uh, it's a fossil fuel, but still, when you look at the NGF scenarios, for example, for 1.5 degree, uh, the absolute level for natural gas will grow in the future. And the share on a global level is still like 20 to 25% uh, in 2030, even in the 1.5 degree scenario. So you, you, we still expect that there will be a lot of investment going towards natural gas in the future. And also what's really interesting is, is the exposure to nuclear. Uh, it's actually something that is not expected to grow uh, on an absolute level, or that's not reflected in the scenarios. But uh, for example, at Varma, we, we think that it's absolutely a, a good way of producing electricity. But there are some risks regarding ESG there, regarding let's say, the, the supply chain, for example, for uranium. A lot of the uranium, uranium is sourced from relatively unstable governments or, or areas, and you need to take into account that geopolitical shocks may impact the supply chains and may drive up the, 
the cost for, for a company like this. And one element also that I would bring into the analysis is the physical climate risks, especially for, for nuclear power. What we've seen in the past couple of years, especially in Europe, is that the heat waves um, have affected the, the, the reliability of these facilities. Uh, there have been cases where the plants have been shut down for excessive periods of time due to their ability of, of not being able to cool them down. And this is something that could be brought into the analysis. Do we, we could do a using geographical data for 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 mapping out the facilities and comparing that with other 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 utilities to look at if the facilities are actually located in areas that are more prone to climate related physical risks. And then you could uh, do a premium or discount versus versus the peers there. And also one 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 last point is that. Um, CCS for utility is, is a really important topic and it could actually be now depending on where the, the, it's located the, the company um, it could be part of an uh, emission trading scheme for example so in that sense it could be actually the whole decarbonization could be a direct way of cutting costs or even the case if they are able to reduce their emissions more than their allowed budget. Uh, it, it can even be a new, new source of revenues if they are able to sell those carbon credits forward in the market for the future. So all in all, I think really, really good analysis on, on a company. And, on, um, and um, I think that really, really Titans brings everything together for a utility company. Here. Great. Thank you very much, Vesa. So, um, what we would like to do now is uh, allow you to reflect on what you've heard from mainly from our two speakers um, and reflect on what you agree with, disagree with, what, you've done, would, what you would do differently, what other factors you would take into consideration. Um, so it would be great for you if you could have that, those sort of discussions over the next, say, eight, nine minutes. And it would also be great if um, at least one person at each table could go into the conference app. And uh, in the conference app, there are there is a section on polls and Q&A. Um, and within that section, there is the, this room, Zuiko room, the red, red one. And there, it would be great if, you could, if um, um, at least one person at each table could type in any overarching messages or observations thoughts, ideas, suggestions. We're looking for short sentences, but it would be great if we could get few items from at least some of the tables. And just to add to what yeah. you're saying, the, this was meant to be an interactive session and a workshop. So some of you may have different ways because not everyone looks at these factors and values them the same way. So if you want to share with each other and then besides what we said, we'll have what you said and you can also ask each other questions. And we will have dedicated Q&A for later on. We will reflect on the feedback we get from you, but we will have dedicated Q&A session later on in this um, uh, today. I wonder, if, I wonder if we should have said that
Yeah, I would. Okay. So. Mics are going to go live now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We we received some questions. We have received some questions from you. So we will be dealing with some of the questions. But if there are any comments as opposed to questions, please put them through the you know, poll function in the app. So if there are any comments or observations other than your questions for the audience, for, sorry, for the, uh, for the panelists, then please, please put those uh, comments and suggestions into the, into the uh, poll um, on, on the app. Uh, making sure in the right session uh, and it's the Zuiko room. You never know. You might have a utilities analyst in the audience. We may have, yeah. But it, it, it may be that whilst okay, let, let, let's see, let's see if we get any 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 comments and observations, oh. and we can also deal with some of the questions um, soon or maybe at a later stage. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll give you another another minute or two to to go through this. Once we're done with this, we'll get some reflections from the panelists, and then we will go uh, and have a look at the other at the second case study, second company. We'll have another table discussion, and then we're going to have um, Q and A in the remaining time. We don't have a lot of, no. Okay. Um, pigs, birds, whales, there's a book still in the Hawaiian Islands. We have lost name of something.
Okay, maybe just some brief, some some brief, brief comments in relation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what? The? Sorry, I I, th I thought we asked for simple short sentences, but okay, we can read these together. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, so 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 the, we we get a range range of comments. Um, I think Mary Jane is gonna discuss the issue of SASB. Maps or maybe not, depend um, mm. and, and the the clear clear bridge approach at the later stage. Um, I do um, note that some questions relate to uh, whether or, or on the select on uh, relate to the choice of valuation approach, whether it's uh, based on present value models or discount versus premium um, uh, to peers based on multiples. Um, Should I just start answering? Why don't you oh, okay, yeah. start answering? So it? I. Again, we, we, we were told that the audience might be a mix of some who actually currently integrate ESG factors into financial analysts, analysis and some who don't. So we, we want to make sure everyone still stays included and we don't want to go off into a different path that some are still trying to, to follow. So um, in terms of the way our analysts think of, and I think someone alluded to this in one of the comments, is that data is really important. And the data that we can get, and the analyst will comb through the data where it comes from the company reported data. If it's the US, it could be the EPA required disclosures. If other country jurisdictions, um, dis disclosure that, that the companies can provide. But also there are industry groups that have expertise in assessing the data. We also know the sell side having um, uh, methodologies of assessing data. so some, something like carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and then we know there are third party providers like MSCI and Sustainability Analytics. So the analyst has lots of sources to get the data. And then what she or he uh, will try to do is take some of that data into their his or her assessment. And one thing that um, our analyst who I mentioned earlier has, we have this internal ESG rating. So it's a quantitative proprietary process, but the analyst will go through the e-data and make a scoring system based on her assessment of what that e-data represents, the S-data scoring again, and the G-data. Those aggregate scores will come up to a range that allows her to give a triple A rating, a double A, or a single A rating. And, oh, and, yeah. <laughs> some, oh, is that what it, okay. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. Okay. So th we can, there's no way we're going to get through all this. No, but we're not, we're, we're going to keep uh, this into in consideration. But what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the second company. And then when you have the second round of table discussions, the panelists will then um, decide on which which items to reflect on, which questions to to answer, uh, so that it's all manageable. So let's go to the second uh, company example, and um, uh, yeah, uh, we will then have uh, another slightly shorter table discussions afterwards. Okay. So just so you know, we saw a lot of the comments, a lot of the questions. They're great comments and questions. So. I think Mikel was going to say that after this, we have lunch, and we're happy to do one-on-ones if you have questions that we didn't get to. And whatever we can do to help you walk away feeling like you learned more stuff than the time that we have. And so the second company is um, a, food manu a food manufacturing company. It's also anonymous. And um, this is one where we talked about biodiversity and sustainable agriculture. And this, this discussion is a little bit shorter. And what also is interesting was done by a different analyst, the analyst who covers consumer staples. And so you'll see his take versus what the analyst who covered utilities um, listing of ESG factors. So he talks about this is a manufacturer of global spices, seasonings, hot sauces, and other flavorings. And they are a, a leader in sustainable agriculture through sustainable sourcing and um, regenerative agricultural practices, as well as, as um, supply chain transparency. And the reason I'm reading this is because I don't think the folks in the backs can see this, so I'm just gonna read it. And so he goes through those like three examples within sustainable agriculture. 
sourcing, regenerative practices, and supply chain transparency. All those are important to him to know that the company has controls over this. And so the fundamental impact, again, this is, this is kind of a high level, simpler example, but it's gonna be lower likelihood of mislabeled ingredients and products. As a food company, the, one of the worst things you could do is mislabel your products and the ingredients. Someone has allergies and they get very sick or has a negative reaction. Uh, more consistent availability of raw materials by having this sustainable agriculture approach and regenerative um, agriculture. And then lower risk of supply chain disruption in key markets. And we know that can happen. And this company's competitor had a live situation recently where th their big key source for one of their ingredients, which was peppers, just um, had a drought and was not able to uh, come up with alternative uh, ingredients. And so then that company had to put their operations on hold. Other areas of industry leading practices that our analysts noted with this company is that they reduced plastic and packaging, which is another area that we should look at. Um, for all the packaging of all the products. And then products enabled healthy eating as spices can allow reduced usage of sugar and salt. So he was thinking from a societal standpoint, is this a positive? Does, you know, does this cause uh, consumers to not go out and eat in restaurants as much, but actually cook at home. So as you can imagine, during COVID, this company did really well because everybody had to cook at home, but then they, they often um, took on those practices of cooking healthy and continued cooking even after COVID was um, over. So the fundamental impacts for these two examples are packaging has lower costs, so and also a positive is less plastic content. And then consumers perceive the product offers better value and health, which could drive market share gains and better overall category growth. And then thirdly, this industry, this company is an industry leader in farming community relationships. So when we talk about the supply chain and transparency and um, some of their biggest uh, spices and flavorings come from very different places around the world. And the size of the farms are very large or they're very small, um, but they wanna support local farmers. And so they invest the time to, uh, they did it here, it says, helping over 30,000 small, small land owner farmers with regenerative farming techniques and also nutrition training. And the, there's a long list of what else they did, but we don't have enough space. And then they also supported women because a lot of these small farms, and this is, again, this is 30,000 as an example, the women were kind of left out of the operation and the decision-making. So they brought training to the women to also be able to participate in the, the planning for the farms and gave them financial access, which is something they also need because so many of them started their own farms. So cultivating this investment in the community has allowed them to keep new sources. If there's a weather issue, they can go to the other source. And this multi-generation, they will continue to get that supply, but in a sustainable way, rather than just continually taking it and moving to someplace else. So the fundamental impact he talks about is resilience in the supply chain, um, healthcare for the farmers, and also capacity in planning. But the other part is longevity and contracts. So he doesn't have to worry, or the company doesn't have to worry as much that this is only going to last for two years. This could go on for 20 years. And that's something that is good for the community, good for the agriculture practice, and then good for the company and us as shareholders. And then if we go into um, how he looks at integrating these factors, he looks at the risk reward and valuation. And he says companies trading at a premium to its packaged food sector in the next 12 months PE, driven by superior end market growth and lower risk profile. And see, so you can see one uh, standard deviation of one each way. Um, on it averaged 45% pre premium in the next 12 months PE versus its large cap staples peers over the past five years, uh, which he thinks is important. And the industry leading practice of ESG metrics help reduce the downside risks by letting him know what's happening, those metrics, and leading to a relatively modest downside scenario. So you can see on the right, he has his upside downside. Again, these are slightly fictitious numbers because uh, we were told we can't tell you the name of the company, but you can see the PE and you can see the um, EPS for bear, base, and bull. And you'll see what the um, target price, how it, it changes over time. And then, uh, sorry, changes with the PE. Um, and then the, the bottom part, you'll see the target price for 2024, upside, downside, 
and the risk versus reward versus risk ratio. And um, it's a 2.8 times reward. And so we th he thinks that this is an attractive company. So I'm going to pause there and then pass it back over to Vesa to talk about other points. Thank you, Mary Jane. <clears throat> Um, I also like like this uh, analysis and the company case. I, uh, when you reflect on the utility company here, there are slightly different weights on the ESG factors. Um, of course, you're a food producer, so environment is of, of course important for its own operations. But then again, supply chain is is and the S factor is really important as well. And the whole supply chain transparency has has gained a lot of importance in the last few years and there are several documented cases where failures in the supply chain has affected companies financial performance uh, for example one mechanism how this could happen is that um, there are currently a lot of data providers and third parties who are going through the supply chains of, of, of individual companies and for for violations for example and then investors like ourselves at uh, Varma we are designing our investment processes around the data so basically, if there are severe enough violations within those companies and their supply chains, we will basically first um, engage them and then blacklist those companies. So we will die and divest from those companies. And if you're doing this in a big, large enough scale, basically you're affecting the prices of the comp company stock and, and the cost of capital for the company. Um, then again, physical risk, of course, is really important, as, as Mary Jane highlighted there. Um, so analysis also if there are any and if they, the crops and the fields are located in areas with increased risk for climate events such as droughts um, uh, and 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 he heat waves is important. Then again, the same thing could be applied for biodiversity. Um, for example, invasive species could have immediate and 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 uh, huge impact and could really destroy the whole crops uh, in, in, in worst cases. So analyzing if the company has any policies regarding biodiversity, comparing that to, to other, other similar companies, that investing in biodiversity could be a cost for the company, but then again, it will reduce the risk for the future also. Uh, these kind of analysis could be, could be, or when you try to fork these kind of biodiversity issues, tools like Encore that were highlighted in the previous session could be used also. Um, SBTN provides a materiality map that you could use for industries. Um, and then, also, of course, the exclusionary policy works also for biodiversity. So controversy regarding biodiversity, it's becoming more and more apparent. For example, in, in Europe, we, there are benchmark regulations which are excluding companies that have biodiversity violations uh, who are not taking environmental issues into account. A sustainable institutional investors are doing the same. So it's, there's a large movement of divesting in from these companies uh, as a whole. Uh, well, and there are a lot, a lot of different elements that I could go through, like uh, green patents, for example. Companies who are investing in those usually enjoy a lower cost of <coughs> cap capital in the future. And, and also company, looking at companies who are issuing green bonds usually results in, in on the equity side, re results in lower cost of equity also because they get uh, more affordable financing for the company and, and that's actually a good thing for the equity and not, not the bond side for example. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll stop there because we, I know we're short on time. Okay, thank you very much, Vesa. Um, so um, let's have uh, another but shorter table discussion now. And uh, again, I would welcome if you could, uh, if you could uh, provide any comments or suggestions ideally in the form of very short <laughs> sentences to us so that we can reflect on those um, in the next in the next few minutes so maybe take just say, take uh, three four minutes just to uh, you know identify maybe key key thoughts key messages uh, from what you've heard and uh, we will then um, then uh, Ask the speakers to reflect on some of the some of the observations. We will then have a bit of time for for answering some of the questions you submitted earlier through the Q and A um, uh, function. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your contributions. I will now let Vesa reflect on some of the items that, that um, <laughs> you've communicated or that you've asked. Well, I yeah. just wanted yeah. to, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say, <laughs> if you see in one of the comments, it's a nice contribution. So again, this was meant to be a learning workshop for everyone. So it's the fourth item where it says, in the absence of precise quantitative data, and I don't know if you can read it, but it says a sense of relative impact based on fundamental knowledge of company business models can help assess valuation impact, e.g. SASB factor, assess magnitude of potential financial impact, high, medium, low. So thank you, whoever shared that for others who might have a similar question. Did you want to? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'll just pick the questions that I'm most comfortable with. <laughs> I'm going to read it out. Can you read out the question? <laughs> um, 
So there was a question about how do you apply the carbon price to your valuation? Um, it, it's a really important to topic for us. Uh, there are a couple of ways of doing that. Um, for example, we use a metric called climate value at risk, which basically look at the company's future emission profile and how the company is exceeding, exceeding the two, two degree scenario for emi emissions in the future. And then you take the excess emissions and then you map the basically the NGFS scenario carbon prices, which are readily available in, in online. And then you discount the future 15 years of cost for the company due to excess emissions that are over their, their allocated budget. So that, that's, that's one way. Uh, you could also do it like in a, when, you, you, when you compare to, to kinds of companies. And, and, but basically, there, the problem there is that it's really, we, we've seen that the carbon price is not rising as quickly as possible. So I'd say the transition risk is, is really hard to quantify currently. And it's the whole climate risk analysis more, more driven by actually the physical risks because the carbon price should have been higher already. And it's really hard to argue why, why the price in the NGFS scenarios, I think it's like it should, the carbon price should be above 200 euros per ton in 2030 or something. And we're not close to that. So yeah, okay. that's my comment. Mary Jane. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there, there were a number of questions for both companies asking if, if we could like be more granular or like give you like the how to in some ways. And that's a little tricky to do for a group, um, but I'm happy to do one-on-one -on -one discussions on some of that. I also have to be careful because our analysts were kind of like, how much are you going to tell about what we do exactly? And what, is, what do we assign as a discount fact? So, um, but I think there was also a question about labor. Did, did someone ask that about labor? And did you want to answer that? And then I'll go back to the next one. Um, they said, do you use, for the utilities, do you use unionized labor? Or how do you ensure uh, labor rights? Yeah, I was just commenting that things like unionization of the workforce and labor issues are not really that important in Finland as we have a government who is taking care of the workers. Uh, so, <laughs> so. But yeah, I, I get the point when you're analyzing a U.S. company, so it makes sense. Yeah, as compared to, yeah. if we do a compare and contrast, yeah. there's only like 9% of American workers are unionized. So, are you done? Yeah, I'm oh. done. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you have one minute, Mary Jane. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I forgot all the questions in the comments, but basically, I think we just discussed, we said, too bad we didn't have two hours, because then we could actually go through all the comments. But we'll be around for the conference. Um, so I'm just trying to remember what the other comments were. Uh, someone said it's, you know, pray for one more. Well, there's. Uh, oh, thank you. One, two. Um, someone said, it seems like the S analysis was a little soft, and um, which it's it's true. S is is for the utility company. S is a little bit different because the big weight goes to the E, and um, it's especially for a regulated utility. There are some very strict codes on safety protocols, and so the workers are usually uh, at least in the quality companies. Someone else said, you know, you talk about the premiums. What about on the downside and for our two examples, we happen to use companies that um, do, we believe, deserve a premium, that are high quality operators to show how the ESG factors are actually rewarded in the analyst assessment and how it, they may adjust their downside risk as a result of this positive behavior. But we didn't give an example of a company that has really poor practices yeah, and is going to drive the company. Like usually around. the social side, like supply chain issues and in the social space are basically downside risks. There aren't like it's, it's I, I don't think I'm that cynical to say that like human rights I issues are and human rights basically are downside risks for, for the supply yeah, chain. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And we didn't really get into cost of capital, which is a big part of how our analysts would adjust um, for both companies. And we didn't get into um, rising interest rate environment, which also we have to consider at least for the utilities, but for all companies. Thank you very much. We've got to ended at, at, at that point. So I, I would like to thank the speakers. But before I do that properly, I'll ask my colleague Anthony to uh, um, explain 
few things about the um, investor education. Thank you very much. So many of you will have seen, but probably not heard, my video that's been playing in the plenary <laughs> sessions around investor education. So I'll try and articulate that now and explain what this is all about. Um, so as Michal said, you know, the theme of this conference is moving from commitment to action. And we know that training and education are one of the most significant things that organizations can do to realize the benefits of their responsible investment strategies and ultimately to have impact. And that's why uh, at PRI, we're starting to develop new educational products, work more closely with our guidance team to give you the tools to, to make those actions in your organizations. So you may have heard about the PRI Academy. The PRI Academy is our online training arm. We provide practical and applied short online training courses, which allow you to rapidly upskill your organizations in, in best practice uh, and responsible investment. We're translating all these courses uh, into Japanese. We've launched some Japanese uh, versions at the conference today. But what I want to talk to you here about is we're also starting to further develop the Academy offering. We're looking at how we can support uh, more expert teams on more expert topics, how we can create more regionalized content. And we've been working hard behind the scenes to create a new methodology for doing that. Uh, and what we're developing is a three-part blended approach. Uh, we believe that the classroom session, like today, is really important. So you can meet with your peers, so you can have regionalized specific content on particular topics. We also know that our online learning is incredibly impactful in helping to embed that. So it's not just one hit of training, but actually something that is ongoing, you can come back to, you can refresh, you can use as a resource. Uh, and then we've developed this three-part approach with a final session that we're calling the RSQ, which is a really important part of this methodology we've developed. So you have the classroom, you have the online learning, and then you bring back your teams with a virtual tutor with the expectation they will discuss what that was like in practice. So they will take the examples, for example, we've been through today, that will be taken into the organization, then the analyst teams will, will come together in a classroom again, and they'll be expected to say, well, these were the challenges I faced. Ask the expert how they deal with those socialize that learning again. And it creates a very strong sense through the organization of we need to be not just learning this, but applying it, discussing how we're applying it, and talking about the challenges we have. So we're piloting this new approach, having worked on the, a lot on the research and the development of it. Uh, and for everyone in the room today, we would invite you to zap the QR code here. You will then get access to a, uh, a case study, which is taken and adapted from our uh, flagship program, Applied RI. So this is a case study which looks at a hypothetical fund making a hypothetical investment in Tesla. It uses a simplified uh, version of the PRI's integration framework and goes through many of those steps from the qualitative to the quantitative analysis and ultimately uh, the, the decision as to whether you make that investment or not, and then how you communicate it. Those who then complete this will be invited back to a, a virtual session uh, where you'll have the opportunity to discuss uh, how you found implementing some of this in practice uh, and to explore further with Michael and colleagues uh, as to, to what the challenges were you faced. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and thank you, and I'll leave Michael to, to close the session. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thanks very much for your contributions. Thanks very much for your comments. Thank you for attending. Um, I'm afraid we could only go through a small selection of those observations and questions, but I would also like to thank our panelists, um, and I uh, wish you the uh, you know, uh, pleasant enjoyment of the rest of the conference. Thank and you. For those of you in a rush and want to, um, if you want to give your, I think a lot of you might be asset managers, if you want to give your card to my colleagues, we could follow up with you if you're in a rush. So anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.